Father, we pray that you would give us insight into Genesis 3, that we might understand what has gone wrong, and we pray that you'd give us a a deeper and fuller understanding of Genesis 12, that we might know what you've promised to do to address this problem. So Lord, we pray that you would be exposing us to ourselves now and helping us to understand who we are and what it means to be a sinner, and, and we pray that this would enable us to, to overcome in our lives, to, to be more than conquerors uh, through faith in Christ. So we pray that you would give us wisdom and insight now by your word, and we ask that you would do it in Christ's name, amen. So I would invite you to open with me to Genesis 3, and my plan for this session is simply to walk through this text and uh, develop something that I said in the first session yesterday morning, which has to do with the way that the plot conflict of the Bible is introduced, the plot conflict of the overarching master story meta narrative of Scripture is introduced here in Genesis 3 with a corresponding uh, resolution to that plot conflict conflict intimated here in Genesis 3 and then developed some more in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. So let's uh, drop in here and start reading at, at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And we read here, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. And the, you, you may be aware of this, the term that's rendered crafty in, in the ESV is the same term that is rendered naked in Genesis 2.25 in the statement that the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So we're dealing with a situation where at this point the man and the woman have not sinned and they can be totally exposed and vulnerable before one another with no fear that they will be wronged or taken from or harmed in any way, with no with no shame, with no uh, suspicion that they might be looked at in a way they don't want to be looked at, and with no impulse on the part of either to wrong the other. They, they are perfectly pure and innocent at this point, and the, the world that God has made is all very good as Genesis 1, 31 states it. And, and um, one of the things that, that I'd like to highlight by the reuse of this term crafty is the vast interconnectedness of these early chapters of Genesis. And what I mean by, when I say the vast interconnectedness of these chapters is the way that these phrases, some of them, are introduced in Genesis 1, and then when they are reused, say in Genesis 2, or when a phrase is introduced in Genesis 2, and then it is reused in Genesis 3, Again, this sense of continuity is developed. And and you really have the sense as you read these chapters, slowly, carefully, meditatively, preferably in the original, as you read these chapters, you have the sense that these things are being identified with these words for the first time. So, for instance, in uh, 2.19, now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field. And then we have that same phrase, any other beast of the field in 3.1. So that causes us to think of this serpent as one of the beasts of the field that God caused to, to be formed out of the ground back in 2.19. And that ties us into the, the sort of development of this narrative. And, and there's an important order of characters who appear, well, the order in which the the characters appear in the narrative that is in the process of being subverted. What I mean is that in Genesis 2, at the beginning, uh, the, the only character on the scene is God, who is resting. And then as you continue through the chapter, in 2, 7, the Lord God formed the man. So first you have God, and then he forms the man, and then as you continue uh, through the narrative, he, th- he next forms the beasts, and then the woman, and now in Genesis 3, that order of creation, uh, God, man, beasts, woman, is going to be upended, it's going to be flipped on its head, so that we're going to go beasts, and then 
the woman, the beast is going to engage the woman in conversation, and then the man is going to come on the scene, and then finally God comes on the scene. So, so this is one of the ways I think that Moses is communicating that in the way that he pursues his agenda, the serpent is subverting the created order. So the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And even in that statement that the Lord God had made, the serpent is being placed under the Lord God. He is a creature who is now engaging in rebellion. And then continuing in verse 1, he said to the woman, did God actually say? Now, the man has been put in the garden in Genesis 2.15 to work it and keep it. And you're, you're probably, you've probably heard at this point, or maybe you have, I don't know, if you're aware of this or, or if someone has told you this, um, Gordon, Gordon Wenham, again, uh, uh, drew a lot of people's attention to the fact that these two terms, work and keep, uh, the terms avad, that's the verb that has a cognate noun that is rendered servant, uh, eved, all across the Bible. Um, Moses is referred to the, as the servant of the Lord. You have the servant in Isaiah 53. You have uh, David identified as the servant. And now Adam is put in the garden to serve or to work and to keep. Shamar is the verb here. The only other place where these two verbs are used together in the Pentateuch to describe somebody's job is when they're used of the Levites at the tabernacle. And uh, I believe it's Numbers... Uh, I, I could... No, I have it here. Yes, it's Numbers chapter 3, verse 8. There the ESV renders this, they shall guard and minister for uh, Avad and Shamar. Uh, Avad being minister, minister there and uh, guard being Shamar there. What this does is it adds a kind of Levitical priestly connotation to Adam's role in the garden. And the reason I say that is because there are many things in the Pentateuch that... It's as though Moses introduces something and he knows he's going to develop this concept later and you are supposed to import your, your understanding from later into the Pentateuch, in the Pentateuch, back into this earlier narrative. And, and so I think that's uh, one of the things that's going on here. So the, all this to say the man's role is to work and keep the garden. So that when the serpent says to the man, Has, did God actually say? It's the man's responsibility to say, uh, wait a minute, snake. I don't like the way you're talking about the Lord. I don't like your tone. So you have two options. You can either alter your tone or you can leave. And if you will not alter or leave, I will escort you out. And if you resist me, I will fight you to the death to protect this woman. This was, I think, the man's responsibility. He doesn't do it. So the serpent says to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And even in the woman's response, I think that she is insufficiently enthusiastic about what the Lord actually said. So if you look at 2.16, the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat, and this is that construction, eating you may eat. In Hebrew, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So I think Eve should have responded, we may surely eat of all the trees in the garden, except this one. And, and so she's insufficiently excited, I think, about all that the Lord has given. In her response, verse 2, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. And here, um, I, I think that this is another one of those things that picks up on things later in the Pentateuch. So Numbers, 4, uh, Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, they must not touch the holy things lest they die. And, and so... Uh, you know, one possibility is that the woman is adding to the command. Another possibility is that there is more information that was communicated, like you may not touch it lest you die, and that is only being revealed at this point in the narrative as information is gradu gradually being uh, added 
as we, as we proceed through. So I'm inclined to that view, that the tree is like the holy things uh, in, the, in the tabernacle, that no one is to touch lest they die, and Eve communicates that here. And then in verse 4, Satan doesn't come up with new strategies. He just repeats the same ones. Uh, he starts by questioning God's word. He starts by trying to get people to have doubts about God's character and goodness and generosity. And then he proceeds by flatly contradicting the word of God. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And, and the expression in 3-4, you will not surely die, is the exact same as the expression in 2-17. The only difference is the word not. Uh, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And then he says, you will not surely die. They're, they're the exact same uh, formulations. So the serpent is just directly contradicting the Lord. And then he just slanders the Lord. And, and all this with, with the man silently standing by, saying nothing. My time is slipping away, so I'm going to have to fast forward. Um, the, the, you know what happens. They eat, of the, they, they eat of the fruit of the tree. They transgress the command, and they realize once, once they've done so, 3-7, the eyes of both were opened. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Spiritually speaking, I think they're dead at this point. And I think their deadness, spiritually speaking, is reflected in the fact that they are going to hide from God when, when they hear him coming. And they're, they're now hiding themselves from one another, reflecting their fear of one another. They no longer trust one another. And, and it's as though they've both realized that person was just unfaithful to God. What makes me think they'll be faithful to me? So I don't trust him, so I've got to cover up. Or I don't trust her, so I've got to cover up. And, and the logic of their response in 3.8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden, is a direct result of the warning in 2.17. And it shows that they believe what was stated in 2.17. The Lord said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They eat, and they know he's coming, and he's going to judge us, and we are going to die. And so they, they try to hide. They try to get away from him. And the Lord's response here is so gloriously merciful and gentle. This, this is the God of the Bible. Uh, the, there's a statement in the Psalms, you thought that I was just like you. And this is the way we think of God. We expect him to respond the way that we would respond. And, and I know how I'm inclined to respond when I'm in the Lord's position in this kind of, someone transgresses against me, or my kids don't do what I tell them to do, there's a, and, and then maybe a, a, you know, a, a very firm shout, you know, but look at how gentle the Lord is in verse 9. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And it's almost this suggestive invitation, Adam, would you like to come and confess your sin? Would you like to come and see if I am a God merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin? Would you like to come and, and confess what you've done and repent of it and receive mercy? Where, where are you? Would you like to reflect on what you've done? Adam's not ready for any of that. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And so the Lord continues, not... Not indicting, not bringing, bringing evidence that will prove the indictment. Asking questions. Who told you that you were naked? And then when Adam doesn't answer, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And, and in what follows, it's like Adam is trying to give all the information he can give before he finally has to answer that question, have you eaten of the tree? So his words, and I ate, are at the end of the verse, in English and in Hebrew. So he says all these other things. Verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, 
And then finally he says, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? I would, I would observe that these questions, where and what is this that you have done, are going to quest, be questions that will recur across Genesis, beginning in Genesis 4. Where is Abel, your brother? What is this that you have done? And then there are going to be these echoes of these questions as you continue across the narrative of Genesis, reminding the reader of the first time they were asked. The woman said, the serpent deceived me. And then she, put, she too puts her responsibility, her action, as the last thing that she says, and I ate. And that brings us to what the Lord says in response. And uh, I've got to go fast here, uh, but, but it is important to see that the only person in the narrative who is cursed is the serpent. So the Lord says in 3.14 to the serpent, cursed are you. He doesn't say cursed are you to either the woman or the man. They do receive words of judgment spoken to them, but the only one cursed in the narrative is the serpent. And then that phrase there in 3.14, cursed are you, it's the same phrase that will be spoken to Cain in 4.11, and now you are cursed. In Hebrew, both, both verses contain the phrase, arur atah. And that phrase identifies Cain with the serpent. So that if, if you're reading straight through the narrative, and you're asking yourself after Genesis 3.15, what am I supposed to understand the seed of the serpent to be? When you hit Genesis chapter 4, verse 11, it's as though Moses is connecting people like Cain who lie and murder to the serpent. And, and, and in addition to his lying and murder, Cain obviously was not seeking to please the Lord. He was obviously more interested in himself than in the Lord. And so when the Lord uh, did not respond to Cain the way that Cain wanted to be responded to, Cain was angry with God. Okay, this is, these are all characteristics of the seed of the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And we should... We should note that back in, at the end of Genesis 1, all the blessed fruitfulness of the land was given to the beasts and to, to man for food, and now the serpent has transgressed with reference to forbidden food, and the judgment fits the crime. Now he will eat dust. And then this food will also be associated with the seed of the serpent across the Old Testament. So in Psalm 72, there's a statement uh, with reference to the future king from David's line, he says, may his enemies lick the dust, which is a way of saying, may his enemies be forced to eat the same thing that their father, the devil, was forced to eat. So the, the influence of this passage is, is profound and pervasive throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Verse 15. Now, before I read verse 15, I have to say this. If you're the man and the woman, you're clearly expecting to die. You, 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 you have committed a capital crime, and the punishment was clearly stated. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So I think that Moses intends for his audience to be shocked and surprised by the mercy of God as they process these next words. Genesis 3.15, the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and let's just... Let's just put ourselves in the place of Adam. You're standing there before the Lord with the woman and the serpent, and the Lord is pronouncing judgment, and you're expecting death. And you, you hear the Lord say to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And if you're able to process this quickly enough, you're thinking, enmity? That sounds like ongoing conflict. I guess she's going to go on living, and she's not going over to the dark side. Because there's going to be enmity between her and the serpent. And then the Lord continues, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, snake, and her offspring. And then again, if you're Adam and you're able to process this quickly enough, you're thinking, okay, she gets to go on living to have enmity. And I'm necessary for offspring. It sounds like I get to live too. And then he says, he 
masculine singular seed of the woman, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And I think again you're thinking, we can survive a heel wound. Head wound sounds mortal. We get to go on living. We're going to have offspring. And it sounds like we're going to overcome. It sounds like the offspring is going to overcome the snake. So there's going to be enmity or conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. This is one of the great area of difficulties that is going to resonate throughout the Old Testament. I don't really have time to go verse by verse through Genesis 12, so I just want to say the answer to this in Genesis 12 is when the Lord says to Abraham, um, all the families of the earth will be blessed in you. And then in Genesis 22, when the promise is restated, he says, in you and in your seed, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And when the Lord says, I'm going to bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. The Lord is essentially saying, Abraham, anybody that dishonors you is seed of the serpent. Anybody that sides with you, Abraham, is going to be blessed. So the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent in Genesis 12 is going to be resolved as the Lord curses the seed of the serpent, blesses the seed of the woman, and then blesses all families of the earth through Abraham and his seed. 3.16. To the woman he said. Now what's going to happen here is the, the roles and responsibilities that were given to the man and the woman are going to be directly affected by the words of judgment. So the woman's responsibility with the man, she's, she's made to help the man, and she's made in Genesis 1.28 to be fruitful and multiply with the man. Those two things are going to be uh, uh, made very difficult. So to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. So she's to be fruitful and multiply, and now that is going to be painful. And then... The Lord says, your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Uh, over in chapter 4, verse 7, the Lord says to Cain that sin's desire is for him, but he must rule over it. And I think that uh, the woman is going to desire the man the same way that sin is going to desire Cain. In other words, the woman is now going to want to control his actions and dictate his behavior. And in the same way that Cain should rule over sin, the man is going to respond by ruling over the woman. And this is the history of interactions. But in, on this side of the fall, outside of Eden, this is how it's gone between men and women throughout history. Um, uh, badgering, hectoring, nagging, and then abuse. Uh, the, uh, th however, however, in the words of blessing, the Lord promised uh, a, a seed. He promised to make a great nation of a barren man and his wife, a barren woman and her, her, her in, uh, for 25 years, infertile husband. So these words of judgment are going to, again, be overcome in the blessing of Abraham as the seed is born. Verse 17, to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. And I, now I think that the issue here is Adam should have been a leader. Adam should have been a protector Adam should have objected to the snake, and then if the woman tried to appeal to Adam to go along with the snake, he should have insisted on godliness and obedience. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. So Adam was made to work and keep the garden. He was made to rule over the earth and subdue it, and now the land is cursed. And just as the woman is going to bear children in pain, in verse 17, in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. They, they were dead spiritually as soon as they sinned, and now they are told, you are going to die physically. But what we see in the next verse, reflects the, the, the impact of the word of God. What the Lord has said in the words of Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head. 
Those words spoke hope. Those words were a promise that would be realized when the Lord Jesus arose and as he went to the cross, he said, now is the ruler of this world cast out in Genesis 12. And, and Adam has heard, heard the word of the seed of the woman. We might say he's heard the word of Christ and for him faith has come by hearing. And you can see the faith reflected in Genesis 3, verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. In Hebrew, uh, the name Eve is Chava, which is very close to the word for life, Chaya. And so he gives his wife a name that sounds like life or living because she was the mother of all living. Where does life come from? It comes from the word of God. And in the same way that God has said, let there be light, God has said, I will put enmity. And, and in the same way that God spoke life in Genesis 1, he has spoken life in Genesis 3.15. And thereby, he has caused the light of the knowledge of the glory of God to shine in the hearts of, of these believers and, and, and he has lifted the veil so that they behold with unveiled face uh, the one who is to come. Um, there's so much more that we could say. Um, I'm out of time. But I, I would observe, I just last, last thing I want to say, um, sometimes people say, if this is so important, why is Genesis 3.15 never quoted across the rest of the Old Testament? And my response to that is, okay, the words... The, the, the Hebrew verb shuf for bruise, that, that word is not used a whole lot across the rest of the Old Testament. But the imagery from this verse is everywhere. Uh, you remember what Jael does to Sisera. She drives a stake through his head. You remember what happened to Abimelech, who proved himself to be seed of the serpent. Uh, a woman threw a millstone off the wall and it crushed his head. You remember what happened to Goliath. David slung the stone and it struck him on his head. Uh, and, and on and on we could go this way. Uh, it, we, you can summarize this theme that resonates across the Old Testament. There, there are these statements in the, in, in the Psalms about how um, the, the people of God will, uh, they will dance on the, the bloody heads of their enemies. And, and Derek is about to preach uh, on an instance of this in Psalm 137. There, there are these, um, these resonations of Genesis 3.15 across the canon, including uh, Romans 16, where Paul says that the false teachers, they represent the seed of the serpent, and as faithful believers in, in healthy churches protect the gospel and drive out the false teachers, the God of peace is crushing Satan's head under the feet of those Christians in Rome. And then we could go to Revelation 12 and see this conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, which is not just the individual seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus, but it extends to the seed of the woman who hold to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So uh, this is the great pl cl plot conflict in the Bible, and, and the, the, the points of difficulty are uh, relational between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, they are um, male and female in the difficulties between the man and the woman. And they are also related to creation with the curse on the ground. And all those points of, of, of conflict are answered by the word of God. As a promise of victory is made, as uh, relational difficulties between man and woman are overcome, and as God promises land to Abraham. Father, we thank you for your word we pray that you would help us to understand it more clearly and through it uh, interpret our lives. For Christ's sake, amen.